This episode of Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico is brought to you by Baby Loves Tacos in their two outstanding locations in the Pittsburgh, PA area. The original hot spot in Bloomfield and their second location in Millville, right over the 40th Street Bridge. Baby Loves Tacos, where everyone eats. And I heard a little rumor this week there may be a third Baby Loves Tacos location in the future, which would be really exciting for people in Pittsburgh. Unfortunately, not exciting for anyone that's not near Pittsburgh. But if you go to Pittsburgh, go to Baby Loves Tacos. Welcome to Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico. I'm your host, Steve Ricardo. And shortly, we'll be playing you an interview that we did with Curtis Casella, the owner and operator of Tang Records, a label that started in the Boston area in the early 80s and relocated to the West Coast and is still alive and well in San Diego today. But before we bring Curtis out, I want to say a few things about what happened in the last week, and by the time you hear this, it will be a couple weeks. Um, As some of you know, we started a separate radio show where we were playing 20 to 25 songs and talked a little about the songs and their creators, you know, like a real radio show. It was called Twisted Rico Radio. It was supposed to be a fun show exposing many bands and songs that a lot of people never heard of. We'll anchor our host who I am thankful for since they also host this podcast, yanked the show from the air after we created a separate site for it and released two shows. It was disabled literally the day after we released the second show, in fact. Their reason, and I quote, Anchor is not intended to be used as a distribution tool regardless of the licensing status of your song. Well, a lot has happened since then including a text message that I got from someone on Anchor this morning, a nice guy named Ian, and he basically told me I can do a radio show, but it has to be in a Spotify exclusive, and I have to use songs on Spotify. So I'm thinking about that. <laughs> I get it, man. I get it. Uh, we were, I wasn't trying to be a distribution tool or anything like that. Uh, but, but I want to explain something to you about the radio show and what I was trying to do with it and what maybe I might be doing with in the future. Having been someone who's been protecting and fighting for artists basically my entire post-record label career, and sometimes even when I worked at labels, damn, you know, I get fired from Roadrunner for taking the side of the neighborhoods. We've documented that for you a million times. Point I'm making here is, I'm on the side of the artist. I want artists to get paid royalties. I've always been that way. This whole situation kind of put a bad taste in my mouth. Every band I ever worked with, I always made it clear to them that their songs and their publishing were the most important thing that they had. In fact, I managed a band that was repeatedly bugged to do a publishing deal. The label was owned by a guy who rode, rode the coattails of a big rock star and decided he could run his own record label. He had one of his henchmen continually bug me and the band for their publishing. I'm pretty sure he wanted the band's songs because he wasn't nearly as good as a songwriter as they were, but... Everything ended up erupting and the deal fell apart and the band was also banned from his radio network twice after they were awarded the album of the year. Why am I telling you this story? Because my radio show is not intended to be a music distribution site, nor did we nor did we intend to exploit any of the bands from making their Five cents a year royalties that they've been collecting. (laughs) I'm not exaggerating. A lot of bands have songs that people listen to and they never make any money off of it. So it did kind of upset me. The show was simply a vehicle for bands that mostly got little exposure, unlike people like the guy we were talking about earlier, who tried to kill a band's career when they wouldn't play ball with him. And that band is not the only band or a label or producer or a former employee that has been erased from that equation. Having said all that, and believe me, it's good to get it all off my chest, this podcast will go on and we will only play music on it that we get permission to use by the label or by the artist, and that is that. Okay, had to get that ran out. I'd like to say I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. 
actually. I guess I was a little more pissed off about this than I thought. A lot of time and effort was put into those shows, not just by me, but by my engineer, Nick Z. I mean, it was like, it took a lot of time to put those things together. You know, it sucks, but that's life. Okay. All right. Let's talk about Curtis. Curtis Casella started Tang, the record label, in the early 80s and later opened the location in Harvard Square, which he relocated to the West Coast and is now in beautiful San Diego, which I honestly think was a smart move because the 14 years I spent in California... I think about them often. We actually met, Curtis and I, in the early 80s when we were both DJs at WICN in Worcester. And then I left for California myself to pursue my rock and roll dream in late 1983. And um, we've been in touch with each other ever since. And whenever we see each other, we hang out. He actually introduced me to Evan Dando. And I remember going out to this Thai restaurant with Evan and Curtis and my friend Dana at the time. And then we went back to his house. This is when he was still in the, a Boston suburb before Harvard Square even. And he played me a video of the Boss Tones long before they became rock stars. So I was enamored with where he was. He was doing really good things for a long time. Uh, he was on board early with bands like Gangrene, the Lemonheads, Bolt LaVolta. Bullet LaVolta, The Mighty Mighty Boston, Slapshot, etc. Some say Tang has been mired in controversy over the years, which is true as it is with many bands in their relationships with labels. However, there is no denying the depth and superior releases on the Tang label, and there is never a dull moment when Curtis is around. So we are happy that he agreed to do the show, and we're going to play the interview for you momentarily. But to get us ready, here's a track by Gang Green. This one's called Out on the Couch. was Gang Green out on the couch from another case of brutality. And now, like I promised, Curtis Casella from Tang Records is with us. How you doing, man? Doing good, man. Hello, everybody. <laughs> it sounds like it's early in California. It's three double digits, but that's fine. Um, it's funny you play out on the couch because that's the, uh, one of the projects that we're, we're, we're working on. And I just talked to Doherty about an hour ago did you know that i sing on the background vocals on out on the couch did you know that no i had no idea i had to credit you i didn't know that oh i'm credited on the record 
<laughs> on the record, another case of brutality. I'm actually credited. It's me, Sunshine Voles, and Shred, and a couple other people. We just happen to be down the hall when they were making the record in Minahan Studio, and, and somehow those guys recruited me, Chris and Walter, and said, you want to do gang vocals? And I'm like, yes. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. I, I didn't look at the credits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I remember when I did a background vocal, I can't remember what it was. I think it was Negative FX or Last Right, something like that. I'm sure your name has been on many records for stuff like that. So before we talk about music, I have to ask you, man, how has this whole pandemic thing treated you, man? Have you been able to get through all this shit? I kind of like it. Um, I had a, you know, it, it got me to work more because, you know, we were, you know, we got to dig out tapes and dig out music and pictures. And I, got, I did a lot of projects in this past year with COVID. Um, that I wouldn't probably have done otherwise. So I, I kind of like what got involved and, you know, with with the kids being on the um, Zoom every morning, it, it was kind of like, yeah, let's, let's, let's dig in the archives and get, get things out, you know, make projects. And our graphics, two graphics people that work with me said the same thing. It was, yeah, we'd love it. You know, we'd love to get some more projects going. And with our distro, you know, it's, it's also a time that we were preparing stuff for record store day. So it, it actually was kind of, it, 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 it made, it promoted us to do more projects, uh, all I can say. And our store stayed open the entire time. It was like by appointment only because people going, what are you guys going to open? Screw the COVID, you know, whatever. I go, no, we're I go, it's got to be appointment only. So it started to be appointment only, and then it just got ridiculous. There was, like, people waiting outside on Hillcrest. Wow. Fifth Avenue trying to get in. So we just opened the doors. Because our, our store is pretty big. It's not like a little store like we used to have in Boston. It's a pretty big store out in California. Oh, here, yeah, so. I've been to your San Diego store a couple times, man. I don't know if you remember one time I was at an a and convention and we went out and hung out and then the other time I was with the Charms and you came out to lunch with us and uh, so I've been in that store man I love your store man it's definitely yeah cool. we moved over We that was a smaller store we moved over oh you have another oh I didn't realize that so you moved to a bigger location we went to a bigger location on 5th it was uh, I think the store you came that was our first location on 5th it was so. like 2007 I think 2006 yeah. or seven, something like that it was the last. Well, I did see you one other time at that. I saw you at the the Boston Hardcore reunion show. Um, and we could talk about that, but this is what I want to do with you to start things off. You said to me on the phone that you wanted to interview me, <laughs> so I'm going to give you that opportunity for a couple minutes. Don't hold anything back. I'm ready, man. What What did you want to ask me? Because I'm ready. Whatever question you have, I have a feeling what band you're going to ask me about, but I'm ready. All right. So a kid from Framingham's doing a radio show, and he goes out to California. And the first project I think you did was in, uh, for fresh memory, it was not, not Restless Records. They called it something different, but it was, what was the actual label that you went to work for it, i actually was at green in the green world distribution office which was owned by enigma it was the sales part of the operation but what was the label because you, you it, it was, was it not wrestling it was enigma and then i started restless records at enigma and i know already what you're going to ask me i know what band you're going to ask me well go ahead say it i know i know who it is <laughs> Well, you know, the outlets is basically, you know, if you have if you have the control to do a record label, you know, and you're from Boston. I mean, you know, certain bands pop up that were just, that we just missed, and you know, but in Boston, it was like unfortunate that all these bands only had singles, not a lot of albums floating out there by Boston bands. You know, with the at the start of like 1977 to say 81. And I didn't come in until like, you know, 80, you know, I didn't start the label. Like I, I was gathering information from like 82 is prompted me to say, oh my God, this is ridiculous. There's no record label in Boston. And you go out there. What year did you, what, what was it? It was the mid eighties. It, it was late 83. And I signed the outlets probably around mid 85. 
And then we released Whole New World. It was the first release on the label along with the Lazy Cowgirls. Those were our first two releases on Restless. And I still have Whole New World in my store. I bought a box from a cutout distributor about recently. This was probably six years ago. Wow. Some guy said, yeah, I got a box of so-and-so. I go, what? I go, you got the outlets record? Go, yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, Restless Records. And I said, I'll take it. So I bought the last box from some warehouse. But I wanted to ask you this, is how did you deal with the outlets and how did you even squeeze an album out of it? Because you're dealing with a band that only had, what, three singles, uh, excuse me, th uh, two and a half singles, yeah, the three and a half singles, basically. Yeah, a split single and then three seven inches. And, you know, when you, when you look at Boston stuff, you look at, like, La Peste, obviously, Natural Acts, um, you know, basically these bands fly by night outlets seven inch record that's it the world doesn't really know how great these bands were and that's kind of like wow you know this is so silly that there's no record label to gather all this stuff to to put out into the world and you actually did it with with the outlets but with a very strange cover, I wouldn't have used it. Um, I would have used just a black cover over the one that was done. No offense to anyone who designed it, but it didn't portray the band. And it, it was like, wow, I was waiting for this record. And this is what we got. And well, it was like... I, I look back at it now, and I got to be honest with you. I, I'm, I was, I'm disappointed with the cover. And I'm also disappointed with the recordings. I think it didn't really bring out the energy of the band, but... Here I am, like 24 years old, very little experience. I did a P&D deal for people out there that don't understand what that is. It's a press and distribution deal. Brooks Whelan actually owned the master. I got the master from him. He delivered the cover. We couldn't reject it. It was like a P&D deal. We could have, but nobody said reject it. Everyone said the album cover sucks. And I was really disappointed about that, but... We still were able to get about 4,000 units of that record out there. And I felt like because them, they, along with the neighborhoods, were my two, two of my favorite, I won't say I didn't have other ones, favorite bands. And at the time, that's all I had to work with, Curtis. I mean, I wish I had more to work with, but I didn't. Because that Boy's Life Outlets single was fantastic, and the Bright Lights best friend single was equally fantastic and i don't think the energy also whitey wasn't in the band it was mike county was now their bass player at that time with the barton brothers and walter but you know what i still am proud of that and i'm glad that we released it it's not the best work they've ever done i agree on that with you and many others actually but we had to get an outlet. I had to do something for that band. I was dealing with weird people, too. I was dealing with Brooks Whelan, Kathy Logue. I wasn't dealing directly with the Bartons. Later, I dealt directly with both the Barton brothers on different things, but not then. I just, you know, dealing with the Barton brothers always has been an adventure. I mean, there's just <laughs> never... Uh, I, I remember every single time I hung out with them and talked about you know, doing stuff. And it was always, it was just, it was bizarre. It was like, we're from different planets. I felt like we were seen in lost in space. You know, it was like, <laughs> uh, I'm Dr. Smith and I'm meeting the aliens. It was, it, I mean, they just were on a different level and a different thing. I go, guys, I go, do you realize, you know, you, if you did a record when best friends came out, it would have been the most historic record huge, in the history of Boston. Huge. And they would like, they would like look at me like, huh? <laughs> what is it? What do you mean? I go, I go. It needed to be an album, and that was, a, I think, a big problem with all the Boston bands. You know, nervous. Look at the Nervous Seeders. Look, look at all the ones that started. You know, bands like Traps, who had the first punk single out of Boston. No album. I mean, if there was an album of, of um, these bands at the time, it would have been legendary. And you got a, you got a guy in Italy over there who's making you know certain records by Boston bands that are bizarre, really bizarre to me. You know, a Dogs record. Uh, that to me was like, what the hell? You know, these are, but he, at least he had the initiative and you had the initiative to take these bands and, and put out albums of the, of the band, the singles only band. And I think that was, um, so, so it, it will always be bizarre to me when I see something 
compiled from uh, from Boston bands yeah. because damn man, if this can you imagine La Pesca, Better Off Dead album at the time when they came yeah. out or an outlet best friend at the time or nervous eaters you know the uh, neighborhoods too the neighborhoods are the same story yeah, man all single without a doubt you know and this is a sore subject and when you when you talk to minahan you know you can't have a conversation with david minahan without bringing that up i go david you know what about flavors what about you know what about an album the prettiest girl no place like home time and it's just yeah you know he's He's not even, I don't think he's past that. He always says, you know, you're right. We should have had that. And it's still, it's still to this day, that's like probably one of the only bands that, you know, you, you must have put out, what, at least two or three records by the neighborhoods. Four. And the <laughs> girl, one never came out. You know, it was like, okay, we're progressing. This is what we sound yeah. like now. But yeah. you'll always have fans want bands you know at the height of their career to have an album on instead of a single and you know boston is is the worst of of any place in, in the country i mean it's just crazy and when you look at a lot of the english bands who had one single at the time now they're all getting albums on it like, where the hell is this this trip from it's just crazy you know all these bands you know uh one of my favorite bands from the 70s Sex Pistols, Class, you know, Damn Dear. It was Trash. Trash was the, one of the first singles. Now there's an album. Another one was The Valves. Three singles, now there's an album. So, I mean, finally, you know, we're talking several years later, decades later, you're getting all this stuff now, which is, to me, is just, it's righteous to have it done, but it should have been done then. But, you know, that's what it is. You know, having a record label, you always piece the stuff together to make a project to give to, you know, the fans of the music. So, I mean, that's the whole thing. That was a real, that was a real special time there, the late seventies, early eighties. And I was going to ask you, I remember, you know, I mentioned it before in the intro, which you'll hear later. I remember the first time I, I came over to your place. Uh, it was in the new Auburndale. And I, and that yeah, day yeah. I met Evan Dando. He was there hanging out with you. And that's when I really, we knew each other from WICN and, talking a few times but that time we hung out we went out to this thai restaurant we had a really good time you played me the mighty mighty boss tones before i i was living in california i didn't know who the hell they are you played me this video i'm like wow this is great it was way before that how did you actually you kind of touched on it a little at the beginning but how did you decide that you needed to do that label and and i think was negative fx the first thing you put out no, um, the first record we put out was a Dan Green. And I, I think the only reason that that came about was that it was because we're at a Bad Brain show. And we're at the channel, and the Bad Brains were late, as usual. And this was like waiting in a parking lot at the channel, you know, at, uh, what is it, Neko Street. Right, yeah. And it was hot, and uh, it, it, it was like, we were sitting in, and I had my 67 Camaro in the parking lot, and wow. we are just like, I, and one of us had a cassette, I, I think it was either Pat or Tony, I said, man, let's play Discharge, let's listen to some Discharge. I said, okay, I go, let's open the, the, the trunk of the car, you know, because the speakers were in the back, and you had, and we had like this hole in the back of the, <laughs> back of the back seat where the sound would pump through. So we were playing Discharge loud over and over, you know, state violence, state control, and doomsday, doomsday, whatever it was, um, over and over. And Dave Collins, <laughs> of all people, who is the drummer for several of bands that I worked on, DYS and The Oysters. Right. Um, I'm trying to think what else he was he played in, but uh, those two bands. And he goes, Curtis, I got the cassette. I go, what, what, I go, what do you got? He goes, get the game green tape. And I go, what are you talking about? He goes, yeah, man. It was like, we're down a radio beat. And, um, with the, uh, I think it was with the proletariat, you know, it was, it was right by, um, Kenmore square. And he lifted, let's just call it lifted the tape, <laughs> a cassette version of the, the, the gang green songs that, uh, never got released. I said, get the hell out of here. I go, what are you doing with that? And he goes, don't ask questions. <laughs> so we popped the tape in and it was sold out 
and the well the first thing when we popped in it was like you know terrorized and that thing was blazing through the channel yeah, you know yeah. through the parking lot of the channel and everyone's coming around the car it was like who the hell is that what is that and it was new gangrene and we're saying man we should like you know call up Ian McKay and just see if discord would do a, a thing like they did uh last, it was it was the year that SSD the SSD control had their first record out and, a, and it was a split with Discord, and it was basically just calling in Mackay and just asking him, "Hey, you know, can we be distributed through Discord? You know, because it was nothing in Boston. You know, he had X Claim, but it wasn't really a label. It was right. just bands putting records, and it was like, and Darty and Mike Dean looked at me and said, "Well, why don't we do? Why don't we do it? Why can't we do it? You know, why can't we, you know, make a record?" And I said, "Okay." I go Monday, we'll make the call, you know, you know, that was basically it. That was the start of it. I mean, I didn't have any resources. I mean, the only resources I had was, you know, Ann and uh, Danzig who had their own label. You know, Danzig was doing plan nine out of his fucking uh -huh. mother's attic, you know, in New, in Lodi, New Jersey. And then you had, you know, the kids at uh, discord, you know, hanging out in um, the discord house and they were, they were doing it. You know, it was like, Christ, man, here's another single by Government Issue. I mean, they had like, I don't know, the day we were talking, they had at least at least three or four singles up. So I was kind of excited, you know? I mean, I, I was like, wow, if you guys are doing it. And I just called him up Monday. I called up Ann and I said, you know, what's, what's the process? He goes, yeah, we, you know, Curtis, you got to get some glue sticks. And you, you know, you got to glue the covers and <laughs> got to call people in Nashville and they used to do eight tracks and now they do records and they, and, and you can buy these records that are already done and put your name logo on it. And I go, what are you talking about? And I go, yeah, they got these things that are they're like record covers that are just not with nothing on it. It'll be like a, you know, like a frontier or a prairie or a, <laughs> you know, the sunshine. <laughs> and sure enough, Next thing I know, they they come out with you know a record that was like it was already printed, and then you print over it with another layer, and that's how they did flex your head. Wow! And I I just thought this was amazing. You know, I just said I go, you got to be kidding me! And it says, yeah, he goes, you can do that, and it's cheap to do it that way. <laughs> it's like, and then when I talked to um, Danzig, it was like you know completely opposite. You know, these you know, he's like oh well, no, you got to go to this guy uh, John Golden. And he's going to master your record, Curtis. This is the way you got to do. And he and he's going to make it louder than anybody. So I took his advice, and I bought. Um, I, I met with this guy, you know, John Golden. I said, "Hey, John, we want to do this record of this band from Boston called Gang Green, and they've got um, you know two songs." And he looks at me, and he looks at the record, and because that's the shortest record I've ever seen. <laughs> I go, I go, what do you mean? He goes, he goes, well, he goes, side B is 45 seconds long. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, I go, that's a, that's a long song for them. They got some songs, thir they got one song, 30, 28 seconds long, another one, 31 seconds long. They were so goes, fast. Right. They were so and fast, man. Oh my God. I go, I can't make an extended version. <laughs> so we were joking around and we were at my house and we were listening to Generation X. And Generation X is, you know, uh, was Billy Idol's first band, and it was just, they were perfection. You know, they put only yeah, put out, I love like, you know, X. whatever, four singles and two albums, and they were just, they just had a certain vibe. And I was listening to them, and um, someone, in the, someone in my house goes, yeah, he goes, play that Wild Youth weird song. And we played it, and it was the second single by Generation X. And it was Wild Youth, and the B side was Wild Dub. And the band goes, he goes, this is a band with our similar situation. <laughs> we, we've got nothing to put on side two. <laughs> you know, we had the song Sold Out, which was, Sold Out was always, um, I would say, an 82 Gang Green's opening song. You know, when you went to see them live, they opened with Sold Out. And um, they, so we took the Generation X, um, what they were doing, which was called Wild, well, all it was was Wild Youth, which was a blazing track, and they called it Wild Dub. I remember and, that. You know, at the time, you had like you know '80s bands coming out, and we were just the opposite. The, the bands I remember are like 
in, in the early 80s were like, you know, Depeche Mode, Spando Ballet. What was the other one? The uh, new wave bands, ABC. OMD, <laughs> Orchestra Renewed. And yeah. they had these great bands that were not our style. But the thing is, they kind of had the same thing. Uh, but Generation X was the first one I ever heard where, well, this is a dub. And it's kind of like, it, it, it's kind of cool as a dub without vocals because it's got kind of a you know any, anything that you put on dub is going to have a semi right reggae beat and that was why how we came up with the you know john golden saying jesus let's do let's put something else in there so i just said here's what we're going to do here's the master tape we're going to take out chris's vocals we're going to put them in in the in one part here where it gets real fast and then leave the rest of it as a dub for the record and he just was like he was so excited about that prop with Gang Green that he mastered it, and that's what we, you know. So did that record? Did that record like do really well for you right when it came out? Well, I don't know what well was. I don't know what we were doing. <laughs> well, you I mean, sold. Did you well. All you know is we we pressed as much as we could afford. We had a two thousand dollar tilly, a bank, and um, I I go I said to Gang Green, I said, okay, well we're going to press this record and you guys got the money. And I go, no man, we don't want any money. You just put on the next record. And you know, the time gang green was um, broken up. I mean, they just said, you know, okay, well, what are we going to do? We, we thought we were going to, we didn't know how it worked. So we just said, let's split everything and press this record with $2,000 and see what we can get. <laughs> that was it. And you know, so then, I'm it. sorry, it was like Negative... I know Negative FX was one of your really early releases, wasn't it? Well, that changed the label, man. It, that's the record that changed us okay. forever. It was like, we're, we wanted to do six singles and, uh, you know, basically Boston bands. And um, then it became... Neg then Negative FX became, a, you know, Dave Bass and Choke, Pat Raftery, Richie Collins... Four guys came up and said, well, we want to do uh, a single of Neg on the record label. At the time, we didn't have a lot going. I mean, we only had Gang Green, Last Rites, um, Noonday Underground, and Stranglehold. Those were the four bands we had. But, you know, Choke said, well, um, here's the songs that, you know, I, I just said, I go, you got to have the song together and with, with another a song to make a single. And they go, no, man, we want to do VFW. And I said, okay, you know, do what the band wants. And they said, well, VFW is a single, and let's do a five-song. I think it was originally a four-song single because we had plans of doing a second single, as Feel Like a Man. And then Dave Bass, <laughs> the drummer, said, well, why don't we do something that no hardcore band has ever done? And punk band has, has done it. I go, well, I think they have done it. It was a double gatefold seven inch because it was available to do that. And I go, wow, guys, we could do, we could do like nine songs on this fucker. And, and that was the <laughs> thing. They, they would do not a double seven inch. And then it was a guy from, um, Saugus mass, uh, worked at the record store, had a fanzine. Al Quint. Al Quint yep. Said, Curtis, just put the whole thing out. And the whole thing was like 18 songs. And that was when we did an album that it was supposed to be a single, but it was a double single. Wow. Uh, but I mean, we had it all laid out. I, I've got the, I still have the artwork. It's all laid out as like this set double single. And I go, because it was supposed to be just VFW and then put some songs on the other side. Because you understand when you worked in radio in Boston back then, the bands would come up to you and they would bring a reel to reel tape. And I remember negative FX had one every month <laughs> and there was like five of them. I would get this 33 second, I'll never forget it, a 33 second reel to reel tape. And you would go to WERS or wherever it was, HRB, and we would string up the reel. To, we would take time to string up the reel. And it was right when they went into, you know, doing carts. So I just remember Negative FX had one every month. Like wow. the band would have like one song and all of a sudden it added up. <laughs> so I, you know, Al Quinn was right. He goes, that's too, you, 
he goes, Tang needs to do an album, man. You got to get out of this single sale. No, man, we want to be a singles only label. And it, it was weird because it wasn't that much more money to do an album, you know, and people, but at the time, you know how it was. You, it was like, oh, we're from Boston. Well, we have to be, it, the band has to have singles out. You know, there was a time one year of, that it just changed when we did the album, just everything changed. But at the beginning, everybody wanted singles. And that's how I, that's probably how it was, you know, trying to do bands, trying to do it back when, and, the boss himself when it started it's like yeah that never. Is, th this story is cool on so many levels so i had al quint on my show and i had no idea that he was like part of the original like tang ideas and stuff what i want to do is because there's so many things that you have i want to do kind of like a band association thing and i was thinking this would be kind of cool because you have a shitload of bands and i've got a list of them here i want you if you can either tell me the funniest story about this band or the weirdest story about this band or something that combines both when I say the band name. You think you can you think you're ready for this? Oh my god. <laughs> I'm gonna start with Gang Green because you know Gang Green has the longest history with the label. I'm sure you can remember something funny or weird that happened with Gang Green. I don't know where to start, man. That's a whole interview on like a separate <laughs> four hour interview. I mean, Gang Green, man, it, it was just so much fun, you know, doing those singles. And, then, you know, we, I, I, the second single we did with Gang Green was, I just remember the deal that we did was with uh, Alec Peters as the manager. Oh, yeah. Uh, yep. And Gang Green, they, uh, Man, it was 15 Barrow Street. I don't know how I remember that address in Austin, Massachusetts, but it was the weirdest area. And it was a, they lived in a dead-end street in Austin. It was by Twin Donuts. <laughs> and their office, Gang Green's office, you, know, you, you won't believe this, they had in the kitchen where those guys lived, Al and Chuck Stilton, um, they had tires four tires that were stacked and it wasn't a kitchen table. So it was tires <laughs> in the middle of the kitchen. And that was the table. I think that we signed the contract on. So this is for another on wasted tires, night. Four tires in the middle of 15 Barrow street and awesome. And we're always there. And, and our neighbors, uh, were Nat Freeberg lived, um, at the very end by the park. If you know the area of Boston, it was a strange one, but it was a very, it was near uh, the Model Cafe. How yeah. do you pronounce it? I think I know okay. the street you're talking about. It's a dead end street. It, do you remember the it's greenhouse? It's a dead end street, but it goes to a park. And Nat Freeberg lived with a pig um, <laughs> on, in, at his house at a park. I heard that pig eventually died, unfortunately, but he did have it for a long time. I think he's got another one. I think he has another one. And then the other person that lived in that street was Dave Bass. The wow. drummer for Negative Effect who eventually so, became the drummer for the Oysters, and he also was with the Liars. He was the drummer for the Liars. So the deal you're talking about that you did on the tires in the house was for another wasted night, right? No, it was for a single. It was for we were doing the 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 seven inch. So this is before another wasted night. Yeah, well, the, the, they recorded it at um, a studio, a weird studio. It began with a B uh, in Boston. And I don't remember the studio, uh, but they recorded, I think it was um, 18 songs, wow. 18 songs with them. It was right, but it was before the rumble where they got in the rumble. So it was probably 85, but they recorded all these songs and, and they picked two songs. It was like Skate to Hell. It was obviously, you know, the A side and the B side alcohol, which is to this day is silly because alcohol became way more popular. Um, with so many times in history where the B-side, you know, became the more popular song, but this was like insane. Uh, but I was actually, out, I was oh, actually was a, <laughs> Michelin tires <laughs> in the kitchen. And <laughs> that's that. exactly what I was looking for. You know, I don't know if you remember, you might not remember this, but I was a judge actually in for the rumble when I was working at Enigma for several years, but the year, that they beat Blockyard in the semifinals. I was a judge that night before they went over to the Orpheum and changed 
the history of the Rumble <laughs> forever. I'll never forget that, man. That was like one of the most memorable things. All right. We could talk about gangrene for a while, but I have to move on here. Okay. What about you remember the- Hearth on Fire, the opening band for that night? They were, their faces were so sad. I, it was the saddest faces. Johnny I A, I right? Johnny A? What's that? Was it Johnny A, Hearts on Fire? Was he the guy in the band? I don't remember them, but I remember, I remember the, gr- the girl's face. It was just so sad. And it's like, I go, geez, if you're dealing with gang green, it's kind of hard to outshow them in a live show. You know, they would just sit there peak. Uh, you know, it was t- the timing on that was crazy. I remember the, 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 you being a judge too, because I wasn't allowed to be a judge. And they said, yeah, man, you're just, you're too involved. You know, you'd be you're biased. Yeah, there were no the Enigma that. bands on the, in the Rumble. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't have been a judge either. All right. How about the Lemonheads? We had such good luck in the Rumble, though. The Rumble was really a lot of fun. You know, the oh, Oysters, yeah. you know, the Oysters almost went all the way. If it was off a gang. And Seika actually, a couple years later, won. Yep. That's right. You had Seika. Seika wasn't on my list, but maybe I'll add him to the list. What about, let's move on here, because there's so many, Curtis. I mean, you got a shitload of bands. It's hard to get it all into a show, but we're going to try. What about the Lemonheads? You must have a good story about that. Oh, let me ask you this. When I had Ben Diley on my show, he told me something that I did not know. He told me that Jesse Perez was the one that did was like acting as the band's manager and that he got them the deal at Tang. Is that true? Absolutely. Jesse was the, the main source of Lemonheads. You know, you, back then you had Doug, Evan, and Ben, and Jesse. And those guys would just constantly be at my radio show. And they were like, it was kind of crazy because... It was these kids taking notes, like Jesse and Evan taking notes. He goes, what band was that? What band was that? I go, come on, guys. I go, let me do my show. I'll I'll give you like a transcript at the end of the night. It was so like, they just had, they were were like, I I, I hate to say this, man. I I called them sponges because they just wanted to absorb like music. They didn't have um, a lot of, um, I don't want to say knowledge, but it's kind of like, you know, when you, you're getting into punk rock, you start with the basic tools, you know, you have to have the Sex Pistols, the Clash, the Damned, you, you know what I mean? The Ramones, the Dictators, you, you have to have basic bands and that's it. You know, that's all they see. But there was, you know, then they, then when they start listening, they started listening to my radio show at the time was HRB and they go and they were taping it and then coming up to me and asking me what songs were or what. I think those guys right there, Evan, Ben, and Jesse, those are like some pretty smart guys to have in one band. I mean, but the they they were going to like a fancy school, you know, and they're all kind of like genius. Well, look at Jesse Perez now. He's like a well-known director. You know, Evan, you don't have to, his career has been great. And Ben Diley is a fucking genius. I mean, I, I can't imagine what it would have been like dealing with those guys. Dealing with those guys in the social atmosphere was was like two worlds, man. We went over to Jesse's house. I remember what before we had. So you got to understand with the Lemonheads, I rejected the Lemonheads um, at first. I said no, no way. You know, I go, you guys, this tape is horrendous. What happened was this: is they gave me back then, as you know, bands would give you a cassette tape, and I got this cassette tape, and it's like, oh. Man, I go. I we call them the kids. I go. The kids are putting together a, a band. Let's see how it sounds. Wow. And they gave me the tape, and the tape said on it. And I still got this tape. I save everything, Steve. It says Lemonheads with two M's, heads on the on the cassette. <laughs> and I put the cassette in my car, and I'm driving the cassette, and it's it's the fucking replacements over I go my god I go they're doing replacement songs I gave it I gave it five not even five minutes and I go fuck this I go these guys are replacement covers and then Ben is the one that said to me he goes well what did you think of the tape I go stop playing replacements covers and write your own fucking songs well they did a good job after that because hate your friends no 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 you gotta gotta listen listen Listen. (laughs) and he goes he goes what are you talking about I go didn't you hear um, you know that song Mad I don't know I go that doesn't sound like the phrase I go no 
No, I heard fucking songs from fucking Hoot and Nanny and, <laughs> you know, Kids Won't Follow. And we looked at the tape, and the other side of the tape was a replacement tape, and they covered over other side and recorded over the replacements <laughs> on side two with Lemonhead song. That's good. That's good. So I took when I flipped the tape over. I w- and I, w- I go, you gotta be, I go, so why did you give me this tape? It's well, the replacement. Because we, oh, we didn't know. We, you know, we didn't do anything. We didn't have enough songs to cover the other side of the replacements <laughs> tape. Oh and my God. I, I thought they were a replacements cover band and I took the tape and that, and then I tur- when I turned that tape over and put it in, I go, you guys are going to do something. That's what I said. You guys are going to do something. Um, they did. And it, <laughs> at the time, you have to understand, there was um, no record by the Lemonheads. There was nothing. But there was a lot of people around us and, you know, all like urging us to put the record out. And I just said, um, one, of the, one of the guys that was hanging out at the time who actually... Um, got me into Harvard to do the radio station was Patrick Amory. Oh, and Patrick, wow. um, okay. Patrick said, he goes, he goes, what's that lemonhead stuff sound like? And I go, and I go, it's, it's fucking great. I go, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very raw basic. I mean, it, I, they took all the bands that I was playing, like the obscure ones, like the users of Satan Rats, and they made it into a band and they got these four, four songs, five songs. It was five songs. I go, I go, Patrick, I go, I can't put it out, man. I got like, you know, moving targets, this new band, moving targets coming out. I got Choke's new band, Slapshot. And I've, I've got this album by Gang Green. And I'm also, I'm working with a, a, a really, a bad situation with the Oysters because they're breaking up and they made the most incredible tape. And I, I'm not even, I'm not, I can't even do the album because it's going to be no band. So we're going to do a single and three albums at the same time. And I just, I don't know how the conversation got to, to where it was, but I said, Patrick, I go here, talk to these guys. And Patrick always wanted a record late. Patrick Amory always wanted to do a record late. And he, he just said, he says, I'm going to put it out. I said, that's the best thing you could do because I can't. So they ended up putting out the first single called uh, laughing all the way to the cleaners by the Lemonheads," And I took, I told him, I go, listen, we're, we're doing our first mailer. And he goes, what's a mailer? <laughs> and I go, I go, it's the packages that you get every day, Patrick at the radio station with bands. And I go, he goes, didn't you do that before? I go, yeah, but not to this extent. I go, we're going to do press and radio. And we're going to take 500 records and we're going to mail them out all at the same time. And I go, why don't you put the Lemonheads with the Oysters and Gang Green moving targets and Slapshot? He was all into it. Brilliant. So we took 500 and they all went out. And that's how the press got this and, you know, got got to everybody. And I just said, I go, I'm going to do um, an album with these guys. And that was it. I go, I wanted to do an album. And, you know, Jesse is... Uh, Jesse, I think, was jumping to the ceiling, you know, I mean, hitting his head on the ceiling. They were so excited. And I go, yeah, we're going to do an album and we want to do this um, record. And I think it was Evan and Ben were at my place in Auburndale. And they said, uh, oh, my God, look at this thing. We're looking for Life magazines for Charles Manson. And it was a Life magazine with an ad of a Mustang. And the Mustang had flowers on it and it spelled six and they thought it was satanic, but everybody else would think it's kind of pangy as to have your first punk rock record with like a flowers and a Mustang with a girl, like smelling a flower. And they wanted to call it <laughs> Lemonheads and just have the, it, it didn't, it wouldn't, it was going to be called just Lemonheads, but the cover, and I still have the cover, uh, was going to be six so that it looked like it would be kind of satanic, but I don't think anybody would get it. So I go, oh man, I don't like that cover. I go, great. I go, we got 20 great songs. <laughs> I go, but that cover just is not happening. And it was, um, yeah, it, it's one thing led to another. We went to Jesse's house on in Cambridge and I was in another world. You know, we walked into that house and there's like this picture of the, Jesse's dad. Jesse's dad is with Gold in my ear. <laughs> And if you walk into the house, there's a picture. I go, I go, Jesse, what, what the fuck does your dad do? And he goes, oh, he's got this magazine uh, for years. And I go, well, what magazine would that be? 
And he goes, the new republic. And I go, Jesus. Yeah, it was pieces. <laughs> like, oh, there's, there's like, you know, new republic all over the place. I pick one up and I, I, go, I go, wow. Okay. I go, I go. And I said to the guys, we had, um, it was, we were just at his house, just hanging out. And, um, I mean, I go, I have problems with this cover, guys. I go, you really want to use this cover? And he goes, we got any better ideas? And I, I didn't. And Jesse had a, a wine cellar. And he goes, well, what are we talking about? I get a glass a bottle of wine. I go, a bottle of wine? I go, let's well, get like a six-pack of mud bottles. So what do you mean a bottle of wine? He goes, well, we got a wine cellar. And I go, okay. And um, he opens up a bottle of wine, and they got these filing cabinets. Um, that was in like a hall, it was like, I don't know if it was a living room or a hallway, but it was filing cabinets. And, uh, I go, Oh, is this your, your dad's, um, you know, magazines and stuff? He goes, Oh no. He goes, that's our family photos. And, <laughs> look, and I go, I go, wow. I go, really? I go, we keep it in a filing cabinet, not like a, you know, a parlor book, you know, in the living room. He goes, yeah, we keep it in a filing cabinet. Wow. I open the, he opens a filing cabinet and I go, I go, this is you when you were young. And it's like, you know, two little kids walking down, uh, you know, road <laughs> in Cambridge somewhere holding toy guns. And I go, it's your fucking record cover right there. I go, good call. I, what song do you want to open the record with? I go inside too. And he goes, Hey, your friends. I go fucking, Hey, your friends, two fucking little kids walking down the road. That's your cover. He goes, huh? I go, yeah, let's go. This is it. I'm taking this picture. That was the end of it. And I pressed the record. That's awesome. I got to get you moving along here because I do think Hate Your Friends, Creator, and Lick are three of the best independent records ever made. I do have to say one other thing. It's funny how everything's connected because Patrick Amory, my office was next to his for two years when him and Gerard were running Homestead and I was running Giant. And I was right next to Patrick. I didn't really get along very well with those guys, but I do remember Patrick. Okay, you ready? Bullet LaVolta. <laughs> okay, where do we start? Um, <laughs> damn. Well, their first two records that you put out were fantastic as well. I mean, it's like you just have a track record, Curtis. I don't know what to tell you. Was there anything funny about those guys, or were they all serious? There was always something funny because you had Corey Lou Brenner in the band, uh, <laughs> who was the who was basically our mentor. He was already in bands before Bowl of Ulta. And the other guys were not. I mean, except for uh, Yucky. You know, Yucky comes from the Midwest, comes from Indiana. Right. And he, we didn't know him. All we, we we knew him for one thing. We knew him because he was the graphic designer of the Zero Boys Vicious Circle record cover, which is one of our favorite record covers when it comes to punk rock. And I go, and he designed that. And he moved wow, to Boston. Wow, I didn't know that. But wow, I, I go, well, what what band were you in? He goes, I was in the Repellent. I go, the repellents. I go, why do I know that name? Why do I, I don't have a record by the repellents. He goes, well, we were on a compilation called Master Tape. And that was about, that was a compilation with the FUs. The FUs and the repellents were on this compilation from the Midwest. Go figure the FUs getting on there. But it was called the Master Tape. And that's how we knew Yucky as a singer. But he was, no, he was a drummer in the yes, repellents. Yes. And then he wanted to be a singer when he moved to Boston. And it's like, okay, you know, this guy looks like Stiv Bader's, you know, let's, 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 he, and he, and he, he growled and he was gnar, gnarly, you know, Bull of Ulta was a real gnarly band. And these other two guys, they reminded me of a Boston version of the Misfits because you had Danzig who was wicked short and you had the two tall guys, Jerry and Doyle. And then you had, you know, Robo never said a thing and he was the drummer. And that's kind of how Bull of Ulta reminded me. They were like the Boston Misfits. Because you had Chris, who was quiet. He's not so quiet now. He's got a record store, I guess, now in Cambridge. But he's, he was quiet, and he was the drummer. And he was kind of the nerdy kid. And then Yucky, you know, um, was the, uh, just a great front man. Yeah, he was. A, a really energetic front man. And the two guys were, you know, it was like um, Clay Tarver and Bill Whalen. And those guys, they were like a unit. It was just like a unit. And everybody knew that they were going to do something. And um, they picked me. They go, they go. well, there's no other label we want to be on. I go, we, we want our debut. They picked to be you. On. Wow. <laughs> That's cool. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I go, let me hear the song. I go, let me hear the song. Then Corey played me the tape. And I didn't even 
hesitate. You know, it wasn't like the lemon has where I said, fuck you, get it, get out of the room. It was like, it was instant. It was just instant. It's like, this is, this is going to be a, a historic record from Boston. What's weird about Bowl of Ulta to this day, when we play it on the West coast through the store, you know, cause we, we have a jukebox on our website. So it, it's, random right and people Volta, and you know my employees as well they go we don't get it what go, what do you mean you don't i go what do you mean you don't get it i go this is a powerful punk rock band because yeah there's something uh, so they, they, there's such a weird reaction to people outside of boston with Volta. Vol- i go i go what the hell is this i go are the air drums like different from the, they really were a New England sensation, but it didn't turn out like the rest of the bands where it was national. Overseas was different, but California, West Coast, damn. I, yeah. I mean, uh, it was like the one band on the label that people just like, we don't get it. I did see them at the Whiskey um, when they when they toured. I thought they were an amazing live band, but it didn't really happen for them at, at RCA Records, unfortunately. The Gift and the, the EP... To me, like they're both fucking awesome records, but they didn't. I got to move forward though. Ready? The Mighty Mighty Boss Towns. Yeah. Okay. Where do we go? Start with that. With the Chiefskate. They were the Chiefskates originally, and Dicky tried his uh, art at a uh, Impact Unit. That didn't go so well, but they did get to open the channel at the Misfits. Uh, that was a band like those two bands you mentioned, Boulevard and Boston. Those were the two bands that. Uh, a lot of people said, why did you sign to my, my boss sounds like, well, A, you know, Dickie's one of my oldest friends and B is like, it's a, it's a new type of sound. And every one of the, at, including Case Wessels. So really? you know, that, that's the, that's the one you have to, <laughs> Case Wessel said, well, what are you doing with it? Why, why would you put out the mighty, mighty boss tones? I go, what do you mean? I, he goes, he goes, well, that's, it's they're trying to be punk rock and they're sky and it's just a, they're just it's too much going on. It's like Miles Davis bitches brew. I go yeah. I go so it's a new sound. So what's your problem? And I know we had a tiff. The two of us had a tiff because I you know I had to deal with Roadrunner. I had plenty of tiffs with Case Wessels because I used to work for the guy. So you don't have to tell me about him. He was a very strange dude for sure. Oh yeah, so the, the idea with Roadrunner was, well, you have to release this record overseas. I go, it's part of our deal. We you know we got a twenty album deal here. And he goes, he had no problems with Upside Down Cross. He had no problems with Moving Targets. He had no problems with Seika. He had no problem with Maelstrom. But he had a problem with the Mighty Mighty Boston's. Wow. And I said, I want this record released overseas. I want the band to tour over there. I, I want to eventually go over there, and I, I want to see Roadrunner and Tang you know, put this record out and we couldn't go anywhere else with the record because we had a deal with Roadrunner and we had to get like, you know, a, a sign off for from Europe. Well, doing- I, got, I got kind of pissed off and I go, fine. Okay. Take our 20 records. Um, I go, this one's going to be a big record. Wow. He blew I that. Go, this <laughs> and he goes, he goes, he goes, no, he goes, you, you're, you're t- t- taking a sound and you're blending it together and it doesn't, uh, the recipe isn't right or something like that. And I got pissed off. So I went dealt with this other guy, super nice guy for Roadrunner. He was based out of the Netherlands. Took me to his house, cooked me dinner. Um, we went out to Amsterdam, and I and I I don't know what it was that I said. I don't know what it was that I did, but I I just said I go look, I go you gotta you can't you know you guys are metal based, and I know it's got to be a certain sound, and you market stuff a certain way. But if you take this band and just put the thing out, you know, <laughs> but like field of dreams. If you put this thing out, people will come and <laughs> yeah. buy it. It was, they I did. just felt like Kevin Foster in the conversation. I felt like it, it was a scene, a field of dreams where I'm talking to everybody and no one believes me that this band is going to be good. And it was such frust- It was so frustrating. And the same thing, you know, with Japan, we had this Japan deal and the guys, when we want to release, Spore and the, and the uh, Swirlies and Lemonheads and this and that and I turned them in to a pretty much a ska label when I gave, made them put out Mighty Mighty Boston and Buck 09 so the thing was we got 
you, this I don't remember his name. He must remember his name. He headed up the Roadrunner um, in the Netherlands. Was it Jan van der Linden or was it Ed? Uh, those are the only guys I remember. I was in Amsterdam for a week at the Roadrunner office, but I Jan van der Linden and Case and Ed were the only guys. There was a guy named Jack there too, but I it, he started a Murgo with with Tang. He goes well. He goes. I want to handle all the stuff of Tang Records, I, I, and I can convince Case. I go because listen. I go guys. I'm not a I'm not a metal record label. I go. Yeah, we put out Seika, but when we first you know found Seika, they weren't exactly metal. Now they look metal and the record loves him, but they weren't when we signed him. I go. We're not doing a lot of this kind of stuff. He goes. Well, Case knows that, and he goes. He definitely wants to do anything that you guys put out. I go. No, he doesn't. I go. He won't do the Boston. That's After crazy. the conversation, I got a call from the guy from when I went back to the states, and he said, "Okay, we're gonna um, we're gonna do what you said," and they did, and it became a, one of the most successful records. All right, I got one more band for you, and then I got two questions. Okay, last band, Slapshot, because you've been with them for a long time. Or they've been with you for uh, a long time, and many different members. <laughs> no, that, I loved I loved the documentary. It made me not like some of the guys so much, but it was an excellent documentary for sure. Slapshot was originally called Straight State. That was the name of the band, and we were over um, my house in Newton, and we were watching movies. And we would all, we kind of, there's not a lot, of, you know, when you have a big group together, you have to have a real monumental movie to overshadow the conversation. And one of them was Slapshot. And when they, I think it was Steve Ristine, <laughs> he was like, he goes, look at that logo. I go, look, I, you know, because when you put in the movie with Paul Newman, yeah. you have this logo with superstar lettering that flashes on the screen yeah, as, they, yeah. as the movie opens. And they were all into hockey. You know, we were talking about Bobby Orr and, you know, Derek Sanderson. And for somehow it went from it's the, the straight same thing, you know, like the Lemonheads was just not a good idea <laughs> on on this first record. And that was it. Watching that movie and seeing that logo. Like if you turn if you went, if you put if you put the movie in, the first thing you see is that logo. And it was so bright and so historic. I go, well, that's your name of the band. That was it. It was simple. It was that wow. simple to put out that record. That it was not never... like, okay, there's no conversation. And Choke just like, I, I don't even think he said anything. He just nodded. He wow. had like his nod. You that's know? good, no man. Words. That's good stuff. I never, that's I, the mo- the movie and the band and then the documentary. I mean, you know, I saw Slapshot a few times, different versions. They were like, you know, they're one of the best hardcore bands Ever, you know, live. I mean, unbelievable. I mean, not a dull moment. There was such anticipation too when that first show, you know, the first Boston show where the freeze had to open for Slapshot. And Cliff says, "Why are we opening, man? We've been around since '77. What the fuck does Joe think he is?" And that was that was like, I go, I go, watch what happens. And 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 I just I just knew an explosion was about to happen. And sure enough, you know, that record just exploded. That was just a staple. And I saw that. Only, only seven songs, but still. Yeah, I saw them at CBGB uh, in, I think, 87, something like that. It was really early on. John Anastas was still in the band. And that, that lineup, oh, my God, they were just ugh, incredible. Okay, just a couple more things here, man. Um, I wanted to ask you two questions. One was, is there anything that you regret about your time at Tang, like any of the bands? or I mean, I know this is a big question, but is there something that really you regret that happened at Tang that you wish never happened? <laughs> uh, Sorry, man. <laughs> the conversation, uh, oh boy, never happened. Hey, I'm trying to like you know. I, I I'm not trying to. Can I be? Can I be like Family Feud and just go pass on the next you, if, question? Yes, you can do that. You can do. I had a. You know, I know that. We it's, a, it's a tough one because you know there's there's um I, I don't know I, I I've got to look in the archives on that one. But give me the next question. <laughs> 
I was just going to tell you that your performance in American Hardcore was one of my uh, favorite scenes. The one scene when you went through the map. <laughs> Were you happy with the way you described the map of the U.S.? For people that didn't see it, Curtis is in American Hardcore, the film, and he talks about the bands from every scene and how, I don't think of this, I think of... Battalion of Saints, you know, and you went through every single... Were you happy with that when that came out and you saw it? Those guys were here in my house in California for days digging through stuff. It was nuts. Um, uh, it was just... They, they, they were so... It, they, it, to me, they were, like, so inexperienced. They were bumbling the cameras and, you know... I, I just, you know, said what I said. I go, because that's really how it was, you know. I mean, you, you, Reno, Nevada, what do you think of casinos? No, you think of Seven Seconds. You think of Kevin Seconds' house. You know, D.C., you don't think of, like, the White House. You think of Discord House. You know, that that was our mindset, you know, growing up. That we grew up. We grew up through the label, really. I mean, just the times we had. I mean, I just got a call from Doherty, and he was just telling me. It's like, don't you remember the time we went down to D.C. and Wilson Center and how they didn't want to, they didn't sit, speak to us. And I said, yeah, man, it was dead silence when we went there. I remember when one thing I, I just, I'll never forget is certain bands at their, they don't know they're at their height. They don't know they're at their peak. And I just, we did a show in DC and we were just, just so excited to go down to Washington DC. It was Jerry's kids. It was a later show with Jerry's kids. And, Dan Green was already down there in 82, but um, Jerry's kids weren't. You know, I think they were maybe the last to go, you might say, as far as all the Boston bands. Right. And Jerry's kids at their time, it was government issue. Of the, the time was between Is This My World? Is This My World? It was already recorded. It was already out. And, but it really didn't, it didn't really filter to later on. It's one of those records that, you know, <clears throat> later on and later on, every year, every group of, you know, fans use that as a staple. They hold it up. Jerry's Kids album, first album, Is This My World? Absolutely. <clears throat> and um, when we went down to D.C., you had the whole D.C. crew there, you know, Brian Baker and Jeff Nelson and you know, guys from Minor Threat and Youth Brigade, Teen Idols and Government Issue, Met John. You know, John was the singer John of Stab. Um, yeah. government issue. John Stab. He was just, you know, what a character. And they, and we just, you know, they didn't like say a lot. And it was just like we nodded each other, and we knew everybody knew what everybody was doing. And by the time Jerry's, you know, the bunch of bands went on stage. Article, I think Articles of Faith was one of them, and Artificial Peace or whatever, and string of bands. And then Jerry's Kids got up, and Jerry's Kids, super, you know, Rick Jones, the most humble front man ever but he's the wildest inside you know his ideas inside are like you know satan when he gets up <laughs> on stage i mean the guy works for a pharmaceutical uh you know division you know he's, he's a businessman he gets up on stage he's a total hook 360 so they got up and they perform and their performance was just right on it was almost too perfect and the crowd did nothing they just stood there and they stared they didn't move it was it was the weirdest opening I've ever seen of any of our bands. And they opened, you know, it was when Bull of Ultra Lemon had landed and they did the Amsterdam shows and the English shows. There was a certain vibe and, a, and you knew you were going to be graded. That's how you felt with, with doing the live shows. Slapshot, same thing. You knew there was going to be a fight. Jerry's Kids, after the first song, no reaction. Second song, I've never seen the crowd go wild as they did in D.C. that day. It was nuts. It was like their response, they just were stunned. They go, this is too amazing. Yeah, they, I, just, to I, me, just, I remember that one show and that one time with those faces because I'm back, I'm like on stage mm -hmm. with the guys and I'm looking and Rick Jones looks at me and he goes, just like gave me a smirk. And I go, I go, you're doing what you're doing. Just keep doing it. And they just kind of sat there. 
they the crowd were, of DC just sat there and then went completely nuts. It was yeah. insane. They, they, that was our approval. We didn't get it in words. We got it in action. And Jerry's, I never Jerry's that. kids live. Oh, forget it, man. They were just like <laughs> unbelievable, man. Live band. Forget about it. Yeah. Exactly. All right, let me, let me just ask you one more thing and then I got to go here. Uh, what does the future hold for you now? Are you going to be putting more records out? You're going to focus on the record store. I mean, what's your plan now? Uh, Sony is a distributor that does our hard goods. Um, so what they come up with, uh, with these other people and uh, the record store day people wanted us to do a slew of records and they came up, they go, well, we want to do, um, three pro cause we, the last project we, you know, we did that box set that I, I love that, that box set. Box Thank set. you. Thank you. And then we did, um, the mission of Burma stuff. Uh, finally, we just put out the 10 songs of the first, pretty much the first 10 songs of the band's, you know, early recordings was 79 and plus the 82 stuff. It was called Peking Spring. Yeah. This time we got, they wanted us to do one of the guys that Sony goes, you should put out that I fear thing on an album. So we're putting out another case of brutality and we're putting I fear on the album version. It's never been out on the album version before. It's only been out on that one seven inch, which is gone, that long out of print. So that's one of them. The other one is we're doing the Lemonheads Hate Your Friends with 20, the first 20 songs of being recorded. It's not the 13 song album. It's the entire 20 wow, songs. Wow, that's actually cool. Called the Welps. They were actually called the Welps at one time, and it has tracks from that. And it's the Lemonheads Hate Your Friends to Gatefold. Um, ben Diley smirking as you open up the Gatefold. And then we're doing uh, a Bruisers record that is just um, a singles collection that they actually suggested, which was not my suggestion. Uh, a double album of the of the Bruisers, which is Al Barr from the Dropkick Murphys first band, yes, a second band, of course. And the other ones. That, with the, what's weird about Record Store Day? It's a time where you have to gather tapes, and due to COVID, you get to more time in the house, so you get to gather your stuff. So I'm doing three that are official Record Store Day releases with a Record Store Day, you know, symbol on it. But then we do what's called the piggyback. And the piggyback, you know, is basically non-official releases for Record Store Day. They're official releases from the label, but they're regular releases. And they don't count as Record Store Day, but they go out the same day as Record Store Day, which makes it exciting, which is why we did that <coughs> fistful of hits with the outlets on it. I don't know if you got that, but yes. I sent you that package. Did you see the outlets are on that? Yep. So that goes out for that day. So the other three records we're doing that are non-official is Gangrene, Another Case of Brutality. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I missed the main one. <laughs> the main one is the Negative Approach Tied Down Sessions, which are unbelievable. Cool. But we put but we put on a, the new band's lineup is Harold and Ron... <clears throat> Uh, and we're doing that lineup with one song of Negative Approach because Negative Approach are a band that is not too keen on recording new music. <laughs> they like playing their set and they don't like to alter. They're from Detroit and they're stubborn. So there, we're putting out the tied down sessions, the complete sessions that have never been heard. Well, this with, is great. Uh, a cover song of the new lineup, a Boston Breakout by Sham 69. Well, this is great, man. This is a lot of good stuff to look forward to. And I know that you have a lot of fans of the label, including myself. And uh, thanks a lot, man. I know we, we we probably could talk for two hours easy. <laughs> I tried to get... I was going to say, Steve, we didn't really talk... We didn't really... <laughs> you know, tackle a lot. I know you wanted to talk about Sam Black Church, but that could be an interview part two. Uh, um, well, yeah, you, man, I don't you, think we touched if, on a lot of stuff, you know, but I, I think it was fun anyway. <laughs> if you want to talk about Sam Black Church, I will do another show with you to talk about Sam Black Church. The ball is in your court, so I'll let okay. I'll let you make that decision. <laughs> But thanks a lot, dude. And you know, I hope to, hopefully I'll run into you soon when things clear up, and uh, we'll see you at a show again someday. You know. All right, well, I hope we get to see a show. Yeah, yeah me and, too. In the meantime, I'll send you the next six records. So you're getting another package in a month. Thank six you. Records coming. Thanks a lot, Curtis. Take care of yourself, and we'll talk soon. All right. Take All right. care. Steve. Okay. Bye. 
All right, that was Curtis Casella from Tang Records. I told you that would be interesting. He kind of surprised me at the end of the interview because I thought Sam Black Church was something that we would not talk about at all. I didn't even think the band's name would come up. So he caught me off guard, and I'm going to take him up on that offer, and we'll have him on the show again. But uh, thanks a lot for listening. That was a lot of fun. Um, please check out the Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Twisted Rico. Be great to get your sponsor in the show for a dollar a month. Would love to have you. Uh, if you have any other questions or uh, comments or you want to send me music, it's twistedrico at gmail.com. And you can find me on Instagram, Blowing Smoke with TR. There's also Facebook and Twitter. We're everywhere, like I always say. Thanks a lot to Nick Z here at New Alliance East for doing an unbelievable job once again. Until the next time we say goodbye, this is Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico. I'm your host, Steve Ricardo. Keep the rock and roll alive.